Well, my dear, we ask you that you are with our councillors today, the officers and staff of our council. We pray that you give them wisdom to judge the issues before them, ears to listen to each other and by your grace also to you, as collectively they address those issues for the common good of us all. Thank you for calling each one of us, to, to each one, to serve the wider community, especially for those who are most vulnerable in our borough. Give them wisdom as they work with ever tightly budgetary constraints, showing them how to manage their resources most effectively. In order to maintain core services to those most at risk in our borough, that allows might continue to be the caring, inclusive borough we need through a clearly directed cooperative council in which all are valued, irrespective of the labels we might attach them, status, creed, color, race, gender, sexuality, age or background. Give each person making decisions tonight the strength and integrity that they need, the courage to make hard decisions, and the grace to make caring ones in relation to the application of care and compassion, justice and peace, respect for all and for our environment. We ask this in your mercy, O oh God. Amen. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, right, before we officially start, I just want to remind members that um, proceedings tonight are recorded. Uh, members of the public are entitled to uh, filming the photography. I believe we have <coughs> individuals here tonight that are busy recording away. Okay? So, we'll be able to their best faces up. Um, I'm also advised to point out the emergency exits before we start. There's one over there, one over there, one over there. I've uh, got myself a new job. Members, I'm reminded also that the acoustics aren't brilliant, so if you want to say something, you need to wait for the microphone to come to you guys. And then, um, I've got who's going around the microphone, sorry? Yeah, Frank is here. Wendy, there you are. Wendy, Wendy, give us a wave over there. Mm -hmm. She's going to walk around with the microphone and hand it to you. <coughs> right, okay. Officially start. Point number one, uh, minutes of the council. Move and second it. Second it. All in favour? Apologies for absence, let me tell you. Yes, Mr. Mayor, apologies for absence. Keep us to the Cape Greenway, Adrian Mary, Paul Watley, Adam Bowles, Andrew E, and Adam Stanton. Thank you very much. Point number three, declarations of interest. Mr. Mayor, we have one declaration for Mr. Castle Road, hoping to interest in the Union Housing Trust. Okay. So, yeah, I would like to declare interest in the last motion on the agenda tonight. <coughs> Moving on, uh, point number four, legal support and access. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my wife and son are watching this tonight, and uh, so on and so forth. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told them to turn the thing on. That's, that's splendid. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I would like to begin uh, by thanking the Town College of Art and Technology for their hospitality here tonight. I was a student here many years ago, and a lot seems to have changed for the better. So, uh, you know, well done if you keep that. I also would like to welcome our newest member uh, of the Council of this chamber, Councillor Jane uh, Painter. Jane Painter. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Voters of the Dorothy Magna for their overwhelming endorsement of the policies of this establishment of this administration, and they have clearly put their trust and confidence in this administration with a big swing in the Labour. Tonight we will set our budget for the next year. 
And as my colleague Bill McClemens will tell you later on, our budget is absolutely clear in its goal. Creating jobs, sporting jobs, creating jobs, sporting growth and business, and protecting frontline council services as hard as possible. Being a business sporting and business winning council is at the heart of this council, Mr. Mayor. We have opened council's first point for business and planning at Wellington Civic and Leisure Centre, giving business a single dedicated point of contact to deal with the council. Through our business charter, we are cutting direct tape to make it easy for the business to deal with the council. We have a, a major company called Pickstock. Uh, uh, through the, you know, we have helped them through the planning process and so on to bring 165 jobs to Dublin region. This is a direct result of our policy. This summer, Mr. Mayor, some 6,500 visitors will be coming to Telford to attend a major plastic industry event at the International Centre and one of the goals for them has been the vision that they see in the process of our South Water development alongside with the extension of the International Centre. An independent survey by the San Frontier Bank has identified this borough as the second place, second best place in the Midland for the business. Uh, this is after Solivo, and that is a clear sign that Telford and Wigan is a place that sport, wins, and needs business. We have published our statement of our report, which highlights our key challenges uh, improving skill training, particularly for young people where unemployment is above national average. Narrowing the gap between haves and have nots, creating more job prospects. Last week, ahead of the schedule, we have achieved our goal to have 100 apprentices working in the council, Mr. Mayor. We hope that, in, in the, or we hope that other in the borough will join us in making uh, improving skill and training to equip borough for the future with the skill. I'm delighted that we have now identified the site for the New Faith Academy in Pricely, while work is now underway to rebuild Ardenwood Technology College. Next month, we will launch our new free Telford loyalty card. This is a great new opportunity for small and medium-sized business to do business in our local community and to keep the money within the world. Speaking of uh, cooperatively working, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I thank the neighborhood store wardens at a special event last week, and this administration is very grateful to them for the work they have done over the winter period. Finally, Mr. Mayor, excellent news from Dewport, who generates business confidence and reports that Telford has smashed the record for company confirmation in the history of the town. And I, I just want to point
I had the pleasure of doing the ground cutting at um, the Princess Royal Hospital, the new <coughs> Children's and Maternity Ward. It's um, a brilliant facility that we're welcoming to the Borough of Cheltenham and Rinkin. It's a world class facility um, for the um, children and uh, the mothers of this, of this borough and for the wider community. So I'd like to commend that facility. I'd also like to pay tribute to the young Jacob Lee, who, um, as we all know, passed away recently um, to a tragic accident um, in Hadley. I, I attended a funeral and it was um, uh, very respectful. And um, my feelings, and I'm sure all yours, feelings and prayers to the family as well. Right. Moving on, point number six. Public questions. I believe there are no questions received from the public, so we'll move straight on to point number seven. Cabinet decision is made since the last meeting of the council. It's appendix C, white paper, pages nine to ten. I believe Do we have questions for cabinet members. Okay, let's speak. No. We'll move on swiftly. Um, I'd just like to ask the managing director to read a short statement before we start point number eight. Members are reminded that under section 106 of the Government Finance Act 1992, any council who is at least two months in arrears in the payment of outstanding council tax on the date of the council tax setting meeting it's tonight shall at the meeting disclose the fact that this section of the Act applies to him or her and shall note on any matter in respect of the setting of the amount of council tax for the following year. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to call the next of the votes. Present the budget. Thank you. Thank you. There are 350 pages in the report this year. That's 18 more than last year. A marked statistics of 332 last year. I will assume that members have read the report and only give an overview tonight. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to thank all officers for their hard work and cabinet members for their support while making this plan. We'd also like to thank all the council's employees for delivering effective services while making the 19 million cuts and savings this year. We'd like to thank the public for their understanding and support for what we're doing. I'd also like to thank the media for their balanced reporting of our policies. Mr. Mayor, the backdrop to the budget is still no growth in the economy. Last year, some in this council chamber got upset when it was suggested we were in a double dip recession. Well, we've had a double dip recession. This year, we're holding our breath in case we have a triple dip recession. The UK's economy is 5% worse than promised by George Osborne in 2010. That's over 75 billion less income for the UK every year ongoing. And that is at least 170 million, 170 million out of Telford Regan's economy. And I'll repeat that, it's 170 million out of our economy. That failure by George Osborne. Add that to all the other money taken out of the local economy. 40 million cuts in funding to talk with Rica. 35 million in extra VAT increases. 3 million in council tax benefit cuts. 5.5 million in benefit caps. And 2.5 million cuts due to the bedroom tax. Add up all together, and that comes to more than 250 million pounds per year for the Tulsa and economy. 250 million pounds per year. On the 5th of December, in his auto statement, George Os Osborne confirmed what we all knew. He has failed on the economy, and funding cuts will carry off for many more years. So we have to learn to live with this reality. Learn to live with higher inflation, a falling pound, and falling living standards. Mr. Mayor, despite this, we will put more of our efforts into getting jobs into Telford. Be in a business winning council, where I give the residents of Telford and Regan the best frontline services possible. We must fight for the best possible economy in Telford, so we can move forward with confidence when we reflect on what has been achieved, on what is in progress. What have we delivered? 
30.8 million signings in two years. Office space cut by a third, with a 2 million annual reduction in costs. A reduction in headcount, and I wrote this speech before the figures are updated, I say 850. Latest figures say the headcount is down by 985. Back office cuts, costs cut by over 35%, saving over 6 million per annum. More than half senior management costs, a 32% reduction in its middle management level. Redesign and restructure the organization from top to bottom. Strengthening capacity in key areas, commercial projects as well as business control. More cost effective procurement, that's buying, saving over 4 million per annum. <laughs> 776 new homes were built and offered in the year. Unemployment is below regional average and close now to the national average. Protecting frontline services as far as possible. Refurbished ice cream. The business friendly council is a leader said a moment ago recognized as one of the top two council areas to do business in in the West Midlands. And as the leader also says, I didn't check this week. The, the headlines yesterday, Telford smashes record for company formation, 603 new companies born in Telford region in 12 months. What is in progress? 250 million site water development, kick-started with our investment. Building new schools, 200 million investment. Regeneration in Brookside, Hadley, Open Gates. Developing, uh, developing commercial projects, ensuring more business growth to generate income. Because, Mr. Mayor, given the scale of government cuts to come, the threat to many of our services that our residents both want and need is very, very real. We're investing 17.5 million of government and council money in the stability of the Iron Bridge Board, protecting our biggest tourist attraction. What advantage do we have in Tottenham region, a strong manufacturing base, cheap and ready to go land for development, good road network, rail freight terminal, now operated by a company with international links, the rail links with the rest of the country, which hopefully will be improved. We are close to West Midlands and I 54, with the recent announcement of a dumping of investment by Jagger Land Rover. This is even a greater advantage. Telford Rican is a place where people want to invest, a place where people want to build houses, a council that both supports existing businesses and attracts new business. Effective management team and administration working together to get the best results for the residents of the borough. For Telford Rican, we are a low tax council. We report tonight the drafts and appendix 7 and 8 show this. We suffer Grant dumping and population undercount, the equivalent of 8.8 .8 million extra funding cuts. In your report, the heat map in Appendix 1 shows the government cuts from Telford region, region are much higher than our near neighbours, higher than the cuts in the side. Telford region has not had a fair deal. We also have low reserves and we have low capital assets. Mr. Mayor, for next year, 2013-14, there are also many changes and challenges. A new funding mechanism for councils, the business rate retention scheme. Then there's the council tax support scheme, which is deliberately underfunded by the government, affecting 11,000 of the residents, the residents who are least able to afford it. Public health will become our responsibility. The PCT will disappear. But funding for continued health care for our elderly residents is still not secure for future years. We have to pick up 8.5 million additional costs each year as a result of cost shunting by the PCT. The government's better tax rate means 2,136 homes in Telford Region will have one bedroom too many, 477 homes will have two bedrooms too many. Our poorest and lowest paid families will lose 2.5 million per annum. October onwards, the universal credit will be introduced. The social fund to help distressed families will end in March. Mr. Mayor, 
they exchange a little bit extra pressure on our residents, extra pressure on our services. We have a 7.1 million budget gap next year, with a further 14 million the year after 2014-15. That means cuts of over 50 million in the four years of this time, so 50 million. Consultation, the consultation started on the 10th of January. The feedback from residents I thought was very informative. The Senior Citizen Forum asked many questions about the environment. The Taking Part Group, which is a group of residents with various physical handicaps and learning difficulties, they wanted jobs and were very fearful about the cuts this year. Young People's Forum, they were so enthusiastic and very interested in South Water development. The Business Forum were positive about the future and supportive of our business winning council approach. The Cathay Residents Association were concerned about the impact of bedroom tax. Mr. Fed Mayor, I find this session with the Chief Officer Group and the CDS made me more aware of the importance of the work of the voluntary sector. In page 9 for report this year, you will see that this gives this Council's recognition of the contribution of the voluntary sector. I think you must build on that. We also, Mr. Mayor, agree core grants for three years ahead of the voluntary sector will give them Mr. Mayor, 1,539 people took part in the consultation. And this builds on the 7,000 comments and ideas received in 2012. Due to the consultation exercise and during the period of the consultation, there have been a few changes. Public health funding came in at 10.6 million. Updated projections of the business rates income gives us 340,000 more. Telford Region is also getting additional one off. New homes bonus of 286,000 because the government tops likes too much to get some back. We're putting 1.2 million into Severance Fund and also putting 1.3 million into Contingency to Save Brown Children. Mr. Mayor, outsourcing is often mentioned and was mentioned during the consultation process. I think it's important to point out how much Telford and Rigdon has already outsourced. All its council houses, waste services, litter picking, grass cutting, maintenance of our parks, care homes, most of the delivery of safeguarding with children, various other minor services. When you add in capital, a large proportion of the council expenditure is already outsourced. Mr. Mayor, any further outsourcing would involve outsourcing the decision making process. That would be back to democracy. Would also lead to higher costs. My experience as an industry show that when you lose your technical expertise, the providers are able to dictate the gender and charge more. So I did make that point. Mr. Mayor, the base budget is 142.4 million this year. Appendix 9B in the report, page 143, shows the base budget movements. The funding shortfall leaves a gap of 7.106 plus the 1.219 for the Severance Fund, plus 1.3 one off contingency for safeguarding. That is a 9.5 million gap to fund. Page 15 shows how it's proposed to close the gap 8.611 million savings and 914,000 from a 1.9% council tax increase. That's an average per week per house. When making the decision to set a 1.9 percent council tax, the administration took into account the strong support from the consultation feedback, the pressure on household budgets, the need to protect services for the young, the elderly, and the vulnerable, the need to put some resources into creating jobs and growth in the region. The need to put a little stability into the council's finances. The need to avoid even more cuts. The need to repair the large budget gaps in the years ahead. And a 1.9% increase is less than inflation. The administration commits to a strategy of a sensible low tax plan for the following two years, not playing games with tax increases before and after elections. Mr. Mayor, Appendix 10 gives our reserves and balances. 
This year we set out a summary of the total tell in, in sort of easier detail, with enough detail to show the need and the use and why some can be touched. This shows that Tolkien really isn't sitting in large reserves. In fact, our reserves are about a third of the national average. At page 43, our chief financial officer has confirmed that he considers that if this report is approved, the council is pursuing a sound financial strategy in the context of the most difficult financial decision it has ever faced. The capital program is given in D2 in your report. Page 2266 shows the capital strategy. For 2013 14, that's next year, the plan is to invest 107.2 million in capital. Pages 232, 233, 234 show the supplementary grants, the borrowing, and the capital receipts. The Treasury strategy and Treasury update is given in D3. Prudential indicators are given in D4. The formal council tax resolution. For 2013 14, or didn't it be five? That's a separate board. Mr. Mayor, I now move the recommendations 12 1 to 12 21, D1, pages 16 and 17. Also, the recommendations given D2 capital program, page 223. This includes a capital strategy for the capital program, the plan building maintenance program, the asset management plan. And the highways and transport capital investment program. I move the recommendations in section 2D3, 2013 14 Treasury Strategy, and Treasury Update, page 3 or 4. The recommendations in D4, Potential Indicators, page 341. And finally, the recommendations will get in the D5, Hunter Tax Formal Resolutions, page 2, in your separate report. I move, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, so thank you to D1 to D5 to move to a second. Second it. Open it up for debate. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, Adrian, thanks. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, without moving off, I've been asked to uh, speak, on, speak on the uh, budget section. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank the officers because, I, from personal experience, I know what a lot of hard work is required to put a budget together. And the officers have been uh, very innovative this year in finding savings and uh, making the initiatives to uh, get to it. Um, our group opposed the budget. I'll go on to say why. That said, there are, there are some good points which uh, we would agree with you at least on some things. For example, uh, we think the one million capital grant uh, to help the businesses come to Delta is welcome. Uh, also, your appointment of a business head regeneration is also a good initiative. We need businesses in Delta. We've always needed that. It's a shame that it's taken so long for you to realise. The merits of this test. Well, we are concerned that um, you're only looking for a three month contract for this. Uh, uh, we also, of course, welcome the BSF program that's continuing. We saved that program in a lot of ways. A lot of that budget could have been lost if we meant so proactively getting it together. Uh, of course, the work in the doors, that again is uh, something we push for. We are quite concerned that may have. Not quite ahead, but with um, our pressure, it isn't completely the right thing to do as well. Um, there are things, though, like the production uh, in school places, we just don't accept that that's appropriate. 400 school places have been lost is not the right sort of approach at a time when we're uh, seeing house building in Florida. Uh, looking at council tax, your know, proposals on council tax. We think are wrong. We should be keeping council tax increases to zero, following the example of Shropshire and other authorities. You're, you're proposing a 1.9% increase in council tax, which equates to 8% increase over three years, something like a 23% increase over 10 years. It's already been warned by uh, Eric Pickles that councils which 
proceed to put a council tax by the maximum of 1.9 percent, we'll get a punishment next year. I take that as meaning that our budget will be reduced. So you're actually suffering the residents of Delta are going to suffer doubly for that. Um, this budget is very predicated on the looked after children section of the budget. The current year, you're 1.8 million overspent. We think that's an area that's not under proper control. It, of course, is a sensitive area, but it needs a, a different approach. And we feel that you're not actually achieving the best interests of the children in itself. We need to get a proper grip on that. And we're very concerned that the budget is very precocious on that. Uh, just to turn it around. Looking at um, business, there's nothing in your budget for the regeneration and improvement of the industrial estates. We, we understand it's a, a difficult area, but that's something that we really need to address. Um, the highways, more money has gone into highways, but we had assurances from um, Councillor Sean Davis last year that money would be increased year upon year. But when you actually look at the detail of the budget, we're not actually spending enough to offset the deterioration in the roads. So our highway spend is up, but the road deteriorates faster than we're spending to offset it. So that isn't really achieving the, the pledges of improvement in the roads that you promised us. So that's another area that's not there. If we look at debt, when you, when you came in as an administration, you made a big play on the need to bring debt down, and you accused us repeatedly of uh, overextending the council. But if you actually look at the figures, Our uh, planned budget for March 2011 was some 118 million. The average term is likely for the 2013 budget to be around 113 million. There's not much difference between our proposed budget and yours. There isn't a significant reduction in debt that you indicated we would see. You made a lot of uh, talk about the backdrop of this budget, how the National picket, the national picture is is very bleak, and our opinion is that that is something that your previous Labour government thought themselves tax and spend, run up the debts, run up the debts. All we're trying to do is bring down the debt in the time of slow economic growth. Of course, it's not easy. Is it? There's no point. There's no point in saying it's all our current government's fault. The issue is the backdrop of poor, very very poor. Investment to the economic you know, climate to find this something. We've also talked about the difficulty of the towns and tax support scheme. But of course, the purpose of this scheme is to allow towns like this one to have flexibility to put in any scheme you wish. Because you've chosen a scheme which makes it as difficult as possible to be people on low income. So that's something that you've chosen to do. We wouldn't necessarily have done that ourselves. So, in summary, we disagree with the budget. There are some good bits of it, but overall we can't support it. We think it's wrong to impeach council tax. That's going to bounce back on us. Uh, we were promised uh, we'd be offered 485,000. I think this is the government money in the previous year, 1.4 million. We, we turned away that's money we should have had to tell for it. It's the wrong decision you made before, and it's the wrong decision you're making again. So, in summary, we disagree with the budget, and we will vote against it. Thank you, Thank you. Uh,
we're having to make cuts um, as best we can, most authorities have to do. I feel for those people that have gone. I, I feel for those employees that are left who are still working even harder than they did before. And also those that are under the threat of being under the will be for the next few years, and the government continually reduce the grants to the income that we receive. And um, because at some stage or other, those jobs will have to be cut, and services will be cut with them. So my heart goes out to those folks who lost their jobs, and also those that may have to be under the threat of that now. <laughs> um, a council tax increase. Well, for the vast majority, I think if I was to take a straw poll in my own ward, I was to take a straw poll throughout the area and the country. Without much preamble to it, I would imagine that the majority of people would want a council tax increase. I would also think that a council tax increase for a small number of vulnerable people will affect them, as it is this year, where we're having to reduce. And the, 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 the council tax support that we were given in previous stuff. However, you, you have to look at the rest of two evils. And to me, we have to look after the majority of the people. And this authority spends the majority of its money, as well as environmental maintenance, the roads, and everything else. The majority of it goes to adults and children for social care. And now, most vulnerable in our society, for whatever reason, get themselves into issues that we have to try and support. And therefore, as I mentioned last year, and I won't go on repeating it again, and as I said earlier on this evening, we're not only there to support the majority of people that ask us to put their views forward to the council. <laughs> We're there as individuals to look out for the most vulnerable in society. And sometimes we have to take a long stand and say, even though it may not be the wishes of the majority, we want to support those people who are less able to support themselves. And I believe the cancer tax increase, and if we hadn't given it, it's true, we'd have had a smaller grant, but it would have still been near enough for the million pounds the authority worse off, which would again have to come potentially from those services which affect the most vulnerable that we look after. And we've still got to look in future years when we're being told that that growth from the government is going to be reduced again and again and again. So, reluctantly, because I don't want to have people to pay more tax for all the support that gives the tax increase. In terms of capital spend and indebtedness, I mentioned two or three years ago that although I found a lot of the schemes that were being put forward by the then Conservative administration, were laudable, innovative, and radical. And selling off of the old council properties was a great idea. Reinvestment in some of our towns was a brilliant idea. But there comes a level at which you can only afford so much, and you have to try and map that borrowing. Uh, uh, Adrian mentioned tonight about so indebtedness. Well, I think you have to look at indebtedness. But most of the reasons that that indebtedness grew over the last few years was some commitments to make in previous administrations for capital works in this borough. Not a risk that most people complain about, but you can't have both. You can't invest continuously in a capital project unless you borrow that money. And you have to get the balance. And I believe in the facts that we've got tonight, there is now more of a balance. And in fact, we're matching more from capital receipts to get it in. We are hugely reliant on those capital receipts coming in. I'm glad now that the receipts has come in for the old city offices side. But again, those capital receipts were predicated from the previous administration when they decided in that public program that they agreed so they can't put forward and say you can have a because it was able to put forward all those agreements in place. Um, so that is a bit of uh, hypocrisy to me. The, the, the other one, which has been over the last two or three years of political football as the children's social services and the spend money. Uh, I haven't served on this authority as much as many other members, but I do remember that every year I've been children's services is getting out of spend. Maybe the old one or two years, it was important to get every year, and it was every administration it was, it was overspent. And generally speaking, it's overspent because the number of children who come into the authority are looked after, they have no control over the world at all. We have to look after those children. Now, there's an argument to say that we do it more efficiently. I believe on the records that I've seen that the, uh, the average cost of looking after those children has actually gone down and has been coming down over the number of years. But it's still a highly uh, sensitive part of the uh, expenses in terms of cost. It's still one of the things that always leads us to the other state nearly every year. 
So my slight suggestion would be, which I briefly mentioned in cabinets, and I've got to ask the apology of Ethan David White because I haven't talked to him about his interview, is that Paul Watley and Randy Townby quite rightly cited on the previous scrutiny committee that we had, it was predominantly looking at with education and didn't have sufficient time to look at children's services. So we set up a voluntary group, which according to my colleague who went the last time, isn't always hasn't always got the number of members it should be going to. And so my suggestion would be is that that committee is broadly constituted as a scrutiny committee to look at children's services. And then, because on the education side, we have the VSF program, which is going on for the next three or four years. And that takes an awful lot of time and effort. So my idea would be to, to look after that increase in cost of our children's services, and to take it out as a political football has become. If it becomes scrutiny, scrutiny is supposed to be non political you can keep it out of trouble in that class. Um, so overall, this project uh, gets my full support. Um, although, obviously, we don't really want to increase council tax, but we don't see the reaction for it. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Um, that's the official response from the opposition. I'll open it to councillors and councillors and councillors. Your official response to the council will be speaking in a minute. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know everyone said uh, thank you um, to finance, but I'd like to personally say a big thank you, a massive thanks to Ken Clark and the finance team, who I know have worked so hard to put this budget together. Um, and let's not forget, members, that the local funding settlement was later than it ever has been with councils receiving the settlement figures a week before Christmas. Well, that's pretty appalling, and I hope the government can get their act together for this coming year. Mr Mayor, I think it's important for this chamber to know that around 41% of councils have so far refused to take the government incentive, compared to 15% last year. And as the LGA have confirmed, there is no clear split, split amongst party lines on this. Just over a year ago, as we experienced the most devastating cuts to local government in modern times, you will recall the community secretary, Eric Pickles, assuring us we're all in this together, that it would be a progressive settlement and fair between different parts of the country. Well, as the Roundtree report of 2012 clearly demonstrates, it will be the most deprived authorities that will be the hardest to hit. And I'd like to refer you to the heat map, which is uh, in Appendix 1, page 47 of your report, which backs up those assertions. So let's be clear about what this government is doing. They are cutting funding to local authorities by 33% overall. This at a time as the cost of providing services like safeguarding for children and adult social care is climbing through the roof. So, Mr. Mayor, as Eric Pickles chops his way through his massive biscuit allowance and indulges himself on Shropshire Blue, he really does need to ask himself the question why are councils revolting? Or, more importantly, why are many of these Tory councils revolting? Why is the Conservative chair of the LGA describing these cuts as unsustainable? Yet, all that Eric Pickles does is show immense intent for local government by issuing a list of savings he thinks councils should make. How patronising is that? I will be voting for this budget tonight. It's a budget that fights back, looks forward, but more importantly, Mr Mayor, puts the interests of Telford and Meekin residents first and foremost. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carter. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is uh, after 21, 22 years now uh, being represented in this council. Uh, this is the sort of banter that we always get. When we were in power, obviously, we were pushing our budget and the same thing was coming against, against us as it is happening this evening. And that's, as it should be, good debate. But let's put a few facts together. I know somebody's commented earlier. If I repeat myself, I apologise, but the fact of the matter is, Bill, that it was the Labour government that left us with £180 billion of debt. 
to the country. Don't, don't jump back into fact. But we have put a third of this already. It's not easy. Nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to do it. But it is coming down. Okay? You might not like it, but it's coming down. Everybody has to take their share. Now, you might say, and you did it before, I think the leader said, millionaires are doing very well. I wouldn't mind the Labour opposition here. What we've got here is for 10 years, when you were in power, the top rate of tax was 40%. 40%. We've cut the 50%, which you introduced only a fortnight before you left office. Very cynical, I might say, knowing that you're going to lose the election when Chuck Gordon Brown made a mess of it. We were then left with 50, we put it to 45. And you're now talking about helping millionaires. But for 10 years, you helped an awful lot more than 40 pence. 40 pence rate, let's not forget that. One or two of the things in the budget, I'm not going to repeat what's been said earlier because I don't think we need to do that, but certainly I welcome facts that were talked about about a generation. I know Bill castigated me at times when I was congratulating our cabinet in regenerating parts of the borough that we neglected for years, like Sunny Hill, Woodstock, Dorley. We started open days, Wellington, Newport. Everybody was at that time very, very happy with that regeneration. And so they should be. But to do that, you have to borrow money. But the way we go in, Bill, within 12 months, the borrowing that we had when we left in 2011 was 117.9. I think within 12 months, you're going to have more than that. So it might have come down, it's on the way back up again. Let's hope that the people out there think that it's been money spent and well spent. One thing I might just say specifically the bulking station, which you took the money out of 4 million. Sorry, it's a fact. We've got an opportunity still, before we do the, uh, the schedule we're, we're hoping to do through scrutiny in the next few weeks, to use that facility for four million pounds that would be paid within two years, because we estimate two million a year could be coming out of that profit wise, but over 20 years that's 40 million pounds in authority. So please bear that in mind. So it's not all doom and gloom, there are opportunities and I hope you grasp them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Um, just to point out from the fact that the um, national deficit is going down, not the national debt. The national debt is going down. I very much stand correct. I'd like to. Um, Councillor Arnold England, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it is a fact that 61% of the population now accept that international banking caused the financial crisis. That 61% acknowledgement is in spite of media disingenuousness to try to get us to think differently. It is a fact that Osborne has created more debt in two and a half years than three terms of a Labour government. We have tonight a public announcement from the Conservatives that we are to be punished by Pickles for setting this budget. That will be Pickles' revenge. Like a bad case of indigestion, it's sickening. We need an anti-emetic, a change of government. The public are sick of pickles. It does not go down well. I support the budget. Thank you very much, Alan. Councillor Bent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And part of what I'm about to say, you will probably... Do I need your microphone? Yes. 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 <laughs> Well, I find this budget disappointing, lacks courage uh, in its comprehension. At a time when our community looked to us as leaders to examine avenues that could help us alleviate some of the financial burden that is placed upon them, we choose a council tax increase. The administration has already pointed to the consultation to help its justification. However, as with other consultations, where are the real options? such as realistic savings, income generation, and taking the government grant. We have an opportunity, because we are about to award another 20-year contract for the waste disposal. Part of that contract will include the collection of recyclables, which have for this authority significant financial implications, with income generation potential between 1.5% and 2% and per annum. This is equivalent to your council tax rights. The authority has the potential site in its ownership. It provides excellent transport options, 
and is a way for residential development within an existing industrial setting. I urge this administration to follow the path I've been committed to since appointment in two successive administrations, and that is to follow that and bring and build a bulking and transfer station on that site. Again, later on in this meeting, councils will, will debate two further motions. And I think they're certainly relevant to this debate. And I would pose a question to all of us. How much do our decision to an increase in council tax affect the community and actual budgets? And how, when they vote household, then try to balance the economic scales within their respective budgets? Given we have seen continual increases throughout the year, energy, petrol, food, etc. <coughs> No, no, it isn't our government's problem. It's been a historic problem, hasn't it? Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Sir Hunter, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Peer Councillor Higgy Lawrence. I think he's a very able uh, accountant, and I have worked with him for years. And uh, I'm rather disappointed that we just simply shrug aside uh, for the sake of politics uh, that 1.9 without giving a reason. And uh, all the reasons for why the 1.9 is there. And we've spoken about it for 20 minutes uh, earlier and we didn't even mention uh, a single item why it should be. So I quite understand that because the Conservative Party on that side has to pose it for a political sake of it. And uh, my second point is, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, is uh, that Councillor England and do this. If Secretary of State does uh, sort of uh, punish, like uh, Adrian said, that uh, punish the, this council, he would be punishing the young, the old, and the vulnerable in this. We are here to do our best for the local communities out there but if Mr. Pickle does decide to punish this council next year, that would be a really, really sad day for us and for our communities out there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sotir. Councillor Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We need to remember why we have been alluded to before. That's why we wouldn't spend all the money. And we even left them no to say so. But the thing is, though, we also spent a lot of our gold reserves. And the thing is that with an economic downturn, if we've now got less than the kit to actually try and alleviate the problems of the economic downturn. So, you know, you guys sold it, well, or should I say, Gordon Brown sold it. So the thing is, is that, you know, we are all being this hard in various different ways. And, that, and we have a duty to our council taxpayers to make, to make life as easy as possible for them. I mean, lots of work is in both the public and the private sector, not had any pay rises for two, three, four years. So their, real, their incomes are falling in, in real terms. And so we need to be helping them. And it would help sort of our, our coalition partners, perhaps locally, we can help support. <laughs> Uh, the thing is, is that yes, it has gone out to consultation, but less than 2,000 people responded. So it's hardly a rousing endorsement, not even a reading the rest of those people supported. Uh, obviously, with a budget report of 225 pages, or how many pages it was, uh, can't go through it line by line as they'd like to. But there are a couple of things and certain points I would like to make out in the time across the day. For the savings proposal, if you start at page 60, item 14, there's an estimated income of £50,000, £1,000 a week from a crazy golf course in the town of Town Park. Now then, this is a crazy golf course, it hasn't even got planning permission yet. So it's going to be fairly, well, how much is it going to cost to play crazy golf? It seems like crazy politics at the moment to include such, such a high level of income. And something that doesn't even exist. On item 26, you've got teenage pregnancy services. That's one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates in the country. Yet this is the service 
is actually going to be reduced. So uh, crazy, crazy. On the item 64, we've got rationalisation of post 16 transport, the new college of the RJ. Well, hang on a minute. You know, the area of unemployment that's rising is youth unemployment. So here we are, we're trying to make it more difficult for people to actually get to the college. Doesn't make sense. Now, the best one is, is item 76, where we've actually got to save it and reduce repair and maintenance of civic offices. Why not? But well, so how come we've got some liability in this financial year? And, and we cleared it clear in the last one. So perhaps we'd have some, some uh, answers, answers to that. I'm just about to run out of time to make it down. But the same way it's going to actually uh, support, support the budget system. Thank you, Captain Warren. Councillor Davies. Thank you, Chair. 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 Thank you, Right to Council Orange. There is a report that does exist that talks about the uh, required standard of design standard on highways. That has been roughly £7 million per year, every year, even when you were at work in administration. In 2008 9, um, the Tory administration spent £4.4 million on roads. In 2009 10, they spent £4.3 million on roads. Comparing that to and the Labour administration in 2011 12, 5.1 million pounds on roads, and in 2012 13, another additional 5 million pounds, over 5 million pounds on roads. So we are going towards that, um, that goal of desired spend. Clearly, we, we started from a very, very low, very low base, and we inherited from the previous administration, which I'm not sure Councillor Lawrence will concede. Um, just on um, one point, I find it very strange for Council Board and others to talk about specific budget um, pledges when they have not, yet again, for the second year running, failed to produce an alternative budget. It's very easy to sit on the sideline hard, but you're, you're paying a huge amount of money um, as uh, councillors to put forward alternatives to the administration. Your leader of the opposition is given a special responsibility allowance for that. And yet again, for the second year on it, you failed to perform an alternative budget. And that's a very, very, very safe point of view. Thank you, Sir. It's Councillor Sloan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think there's been some good contributions in the room. I'm not going to sort of play the, you know, it was all your fault or all our fault, and that's national. Or, or local, but um, I, I do take issue with Nigel Dugmore and the Council Dugmore that we're all just to, together. And th th this is the national government to think that we raise more money by cutting the top rate of tax. Uh, that's economic uh, craziness to pick up on, on, on Council Dugmore's uh, words. We've got a Chancellor who scurries uh, to, to, to Europe to, to ensure that bankers can only get a, a year's. Uh, equivalent of a year's salary as a bonus. Uh, well, I'd like that. I got twenty-five pounds last uh, uh, year. Um, we, 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 I think there are um, um, some able candidates uh, across the road, uh, across the, 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 the ball here. Or um, uh, now for Chancellor, because you, you know at the moment we've got a Chancellor who thought he could save. The, the economy of this country by taxing tax passages, taxing uh, static caravans. Well, that lasted five weeks. I do look forward to it on Wednesday to see what they're going to come up with, 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 with then. But at least we're having a, a rational debate in, in, in this room, uh, not looking at uh, what few quid we can raise on that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Brett. It seems that every time the conservatives are in front of camera, they're that sort of loss between deficit and actually debt. And they forget which is which. Along debt, when you came to power with your coalition, uh, this, the, the, the borrowing, Stood around about eight 
Regeneration schemes. The regeneration scheme on Sudbill was one of demolition. And <coughs> um, money was there to demolish. And we got two shops and four flats. And common areas of open space. Uh, it's taken this uh, administration to find a partner who will come in and do the job. No money was set aside, no future plan for any by the last administration for any regeneration. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> We've heard a great deal of talk tonight about national politics, and it just strikes me that uh, all of us complain when we go out on the door and speak to local people about local elections and local matters. And the focus is always on national politics. And I think we would do well to remember that fact when we discuss things in this chamber, yeah. which we cannot influence and cannot affect. Yeah. What I would like to do is turn back to the comments made by Councillor Lawrence in respect of uh, safeguarding and safeguarding costs. And my first point on this, this is a very, very important topic as we know, um, the first one I would like to do, it's a shame he's not here, but I would like to congratulate uh, the cabinet member for children and young people for the initiatives that he's taken in this particular area, along obviously with the officers. However, the fact of the matter is that <clears throat> despite the priority of this particular area, the number of children uh, that fall into the safeguarding category has continuously increased over the years. My first point is simply this, that looking at numbers of children in care is not something we can actually control. And it's about time the measure was changed so that the length of time in care was used as a measure, but not the numbers of people. And obviously we also need to look at the cost of placements. Coming back to the budget in total, this budget is predicated on addressing the problems in safeguarding. And when you look at the facts of the matter, in the last reporting period, Safeguarding was overspent by 2.8 million. That figure has now increased to 3.1 million. It's quite, quite clearly out of control. Yet we have a budget here which is based entirely on the assumption that we can actually fix this problem. And if we can't fix it, we'll look at contingencies yet again. Now, contingencies can't be drawn on ad infinitum. <laughs> and I put it to, to you, Mr. Mayor, that we're building up a situation here which will spiral out of control. And just to paraphrase Oscar Wilde, I would say that this budget <coughs> represents the improbable in pursuit of the unachievable, and it is totally imprudent and will lead us into deep difficulty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would point out that with us national issue, I think it's the responsibility of all elected local councillors to influence in any way their members of parliament. So to say that we don't influence our national issues, that <coughs> needs correcting. Uh, can you vote? Just made a few notes, and um, I'm sorry, I'm suffering to mine, I'm suffering even more after the news. But um, um, all I'd like to say is, it, it's a pity that the Tories don't realise that what the budget that this administration put forward tonight is about, is about a business winning council. Because we do have a plan B, unlike George, and that means getting people skills and jobs. Because when people are better off financially and they're more healthy, the public health coming over, and that means people will, instead of being attacked with benefit cuts and pension taxes, that they need jobs. And that's what this budget's all about. I can't understand why you're not supporting it. Councillor White. You can't forget that the biggest problem that you've got in the present moment is the children's need. The more in the week 
can't actually influence <laughs> national politics. But it's national politics that's cutting people's benefits. It's national politics that's making the poor poorer. It's national politics that's affecting families and compressing them into homes that are undesirable and making the, the situation work. And it's national politics that are going to make these families fail and make more children come into our care. Since the Conservatives came into power, or this coalition came into power, more and more children, are, more families are failing. And that's what's been better for our budget. Had that not been the case, we wouldn't be in a great place, but we'd be in a better place. It's also national politics that are affecting the whole. The national politics has got the NHS. It's the, it's the NHS who are cutting the continued health budget. So therefore, more and more people are more pressure is put on our council to actually try and support the elderly in care and the people who would require support. We are having to pay for that. National politics are there. We were elected to speak up for the people that we just see. And that's what we are doing here. And we are telling the government now, and we're telling you, if you don't support it, you're failing your people. Because that's the problem. You keep quiet and everybody, they, you think the problem is going to go away. It isn't. It's going to get worse. And we as a council will not be quiet when it comes to people. Yes. Uh, <laughs> can I ask uh, Councillor Clement, he has a 10 minute response from the bottom. I've made some notes and I don't know why. Over everything, but I think I'll start off, you know, and, and come to the negative about national politics. But I mean, our framework is national politics. Most things we do are actually set down by a statute. So, national politics absolutely affects You know, uh, children living after elderly are all set out by government. And, you know, we, we hear people talking about that, and clearly, very few people have got a decision on just standing what we're talking about. There is the debt created by prime ministers. David Cameron has created more national debt than any Prime Minister in history. And guess who was number two? John Major. <laughs> Third is Gordon Brown. Fourth is uh, Tony Blair. And fifth is Margaret Thatcher. So we can get the facts together. It's been 68 years since, I love the figures, 68 years since the end of the Second World War. 37 of those years were under Tory Prime Ministers, 31 under Labour Prime Ministers. The national debt of Britain increased by 970 billion in 68 years. 620 billion under Tory prime ministers. 350 billion created for Labour prime ministers. If you do your mathematics and divide the Tory debt by the number of years in power, you get a figure of 17 billion debt per year, per Tory year since the war. And Labour debt is 11 billion per year. So you can say, honestly, from the figures, if you want to use them on global figures for 68 years, that the Tory Prime Minister created national debt 50% faster than the Labour Prime Minister. David Cameron is the greatest culprit of all. 38% of the national debt is created by him in three years out of those 68, less than three years. But him and John Major together created 56% of the national debt since the war in 10 years. So let's get the facts right and, and go and sort the whole party out so and always preaching to us. You don't even know the figures you're throwing around. Um, I'll, 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 I'll jump around because Councillor Doug Moore mentioned about uh, consultation and so on. Well, can I tell you what you did in power from 2008 to 9? The government gave you 8% more grant. You set the council tax at 4.3%. So your first year, you set more than we had done in two years. And you know how many people you consulted? 570. So the next year, with 5.3% increase in grant, you increased your council tax to 2.5, and you got up to 978. So you want me to you carry on and compare. In four years, you did less consultation than you in a year and a half. Uh, Councillor uh, Lawrence, uh, well, it's, it's sad that your, your comments, obviously you haven't consulted with that, but in cabinet, 
comes to me to actually say he supported most of the <coughs> budget, except the 1.9%. Uh, he told us already been said that he didn't do an alternative budget, which he entitled him to. You mentioned structure, uh, I think we've been one of the first speakers with yourself. Uh, well, structure's cuts were smaller than ours for the first three years. Ours was £72 per person, structures were £40.60. Uh, they got higher council tax, their housing makes it richer, so they get more council tax per household. Next year, Telford and Rican will be subsidised by two billion by the central government, and structure by 17 point higher. I mean, a bit of fairness. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, he, he made comments about uh, the government punishing us for setting a council tax work. Uh, I hope that's not true. Uh, if you have got any sort of evidence to back that up, well, let us know. But I thought your government said you believe in localism. Surely, locally elected people setting council tax within the framework of the government is the correct thing to do. Um, you mentioned the council's debt. Well, the name of the is a little bit out of date, but our uh, health receipts uh, are, will be down by 20 million this year, 29 million this year, and down to 84 million. Uh, and if you look at page 11 in our report, you will see how the interest payments are reducing because we have made some decisions in the last few years. From the high Tory debt that you left us, uh, what else have got? Children, I think, you know. Uh, I thank Councillor Cummingson for his support in the budget and saying, you know, we must stop uh, using children as a political football. Councillor Carter, I'm not quite sure to say, um, but he, um, he, he seems to be saying you want to actually stop outsourcing and bring waste back into the council. Your, your facts and figures were wrong, uh, inaccurate, and not credible. The total Gross uh, value of recyclables, I think, is about 650,000. You've got to collect them, you've got to sort them, sell them, and put the word. And your figures are just not true. Um, somebody mentioned, I think it was uh, Councillor Bentley, yeah. mentioned about yeah. energy and costs. So, well, yes, uh, the government's doing a good job of increased inflation. They're the time for to get the debt down and punish people. Um, well, Thanks from Mullet. Yeah, well, I, I thank you for your contribution. Yes, we have no control over children, uh, no over children into care, and we will not be letting our kids die. We have a robust plan. It is difficult. It is, and always will be, a difficult area to control. Um, I'd like to, Mr. Mayor, and I move the, the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Um, recommendation for um, in block. Appendix B1 to D5. All in favour? Against? Abstention is moved. Moving on to section 9, recommendations from board and committees. I ask the chairman of the committee council of Malcolm Smith to the floor. Anyway, and the relevant recommendations are sure. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, or is it Mr. Mayor? Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you. Thank you. Be clear. I wish to move an amendment actually to the recommendation in paragraph 2. Uh, I move to 2 6, noting that 2 5 is missing actually on the report on the green paper. So the proper purpose is to paragraph 2 6 on the report. Um, I believe we should send this 2 6 back to the Constitution Committee for reconsideration. Clarification on what is there. I'm not against that, Mr. Speaker, and separately in there. I think it's a good idea because it gives some clarity in debates that we've been at and also succession. But I do believe that we should be clear on the respective roles of the posts that are there. 
We believe the Constitution Committee should give further consideration to this proposal and bring this item back to the future council meeting for further consideration by the council after it's pleased to So I therefore move an amendment to move this 2 6 back to consideration by the Constitution Committee. Thank you, Smith. We've had an amendment to move to the Constitution Committee. Do we have a second then? Yes, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I will be back to inform this of the proposal by my colleague. Uh, having looked at this in some detail and discussed it with the um, appropriate officers, it is appropriate that we do take this back to the Constitution Committee and get it right. So I form this second. We've got a, a motion uh, proposed and seconded in favour of the amendment. All in favour of the amendment. Okay. Unanimous on that amendment, so we'll um, vote uh, with the amendment as it becomes substantive, so we'll vote with the amendment included. All in favour? <coughs> Pass. Councillor Malcolm Swift again, please, um, to move. Recommend. Uh, health and well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move the minutes of the Health and Wellbeing Board to the Council for consideration and subsequent adoption. Thank you. Do you have a second? Second, thanks, Mr. Mayor. All in favour? Unanimous. Um, section uh, personnel board, uh, these recommendations have previously been approved as part of the budget papers. Uh, so, no further action than just for noting. Moving on to section uh, 10. Update the borough boundary review. May I ask uh, Councillor Bob Sloan? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Council Board has approved the I, I, I trust all members are being kept up to date, all, all groups are represented, all the three groups are represented on, on the committee, and we, we've made uh, some progress, um, uh, but not reached any uh, firm conclusions, because obviously whatever we come out to has to fit together, and, and I don't want people thinking, you know, because we're looking at a particular area, you know, we've settled on that particular area, because it's a big jigsaw that we've got to uh, put together. I've always said it to, to the council, and I'm going to take this opportunity to remind uh, councillors that, that, that change even with a 54 base council is inevitable. Uh, as of July last year, uh, we all represented an average of 2,292 people, and our officers' work uh, suggests that by 2018, and that's about the date as far as the local government management of new people will be prepared to go, that this will rise, the population changes will mean that this will rise to, to 2,483 per councillor. So as I say, change is uh, inevitable. Uh, they will take into account that uh, uh, as a real overriding uh, uh, issue. So electoral fairness is the same as the MPs. You know, roughly speaking, we should all represent the same number of people. After that, yes, we will get into, into community areas and, 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 and sensible boundaries. Remind you, we've all been briefed on this. They're starting with a clean map. They're not starting with the boards that we've got now. I mean, obviously, we're trying to work through as a starting point uh, from, from, from those. But they, they, they can take all those boards and rip them up. Um, and, and um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying on a cross-party basis to put something forward that is credible. Um, I'm not naive, you know, politics are in the room, they're always in the room, uh, but I do pay tribute to, to, to uh, Councillor Reid, Councillor Buckmore, uh, um, to, to Karen and, and other people from the Labour group. Um, but we've now got a problem, because yet again, the local government boundary new people uh, seem to set their deadlines right in the middle of our council meetings. <laughs> Very considerate of them, but, but there we go. So they want our proposals by the 9th of April. 
And we don't need to get the spare until the third night. That's correct. Right? So what we're asking of you tonight is, is, is that you let us, and you know, I'm sure uh, we'll all be consulted in our groups, I'm not, uh, I still want to be standing uh, in this seat next, next year, that, we, that you delegate to us uh, the, 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 the power to put those proposals through and we'll bring it to the 3rd of May for, for, for endorsement. We can't see any other way forward. Uh, we've done a lot of work and we've paid tribute to, to, to Phil Griffiths, so I know he's a quality tonight. Um, but I think there were a lot of Manchester United fans who were quite pleased with the fact that we was on Tuesday night. Um, well, they were, they were at half past seven, whether they were at ten o'clock, to speak for themselves. But, but that, that, that's the timetable that we're working to. So we meet again, uh, we have to pull Tuesday night's meeting, because Phil was ill. I know Andrew wasn't uh, very well either. Um, and I'll try and set another meeting. I'll, support, I'll speak to Phil, hopefully, we'll be back on, on, on Monday and we'll try to get another meeting in. And then we've got another meeting set for the 2nd of April, which will have to be, I think, our final uh, meeting. Obviously, uh, you can talk amongst yourselves. Please, finally, uh, re respect the work that Phil and his team. We've heard tonight about the back of his cuts. Bill Griffiths has been very, very hard on this, but we've not got a lot of capacity to, to, to run every last piece of street through this. We do need to get this right. Uh, of course, they'll come out with their proposals and uh, on boarding arrangements and, and street names, etc. And we can comment on those, both as the council and as individual groups and as individuals. But I think, I think the experience will tell you. They're not really shifting too much. The nearer we can get the, 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 this, this to something, there are there are issues, as some members in the room will know. When you get to the edges of Bora, it becomes more difficult. You know, there's not been a lot of growth in the major area, so the, the changes are now there. You get over to Newport, which is locked in. I think Newport comes out to three and a half uh, when you have the figures up, and you're right up against the boundary again. In the middle, when you get to the happiness, I get this, yeah, then, then it's much easier and we can move things around. So, just with those three thoughts, Mr. Mayor, I, 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 I'd ask the council's indulgence to, to let us proceed with our work and approve or not. Thank you, Chair, and We need to be seconded first. Seconded to adjust it. I'll allow you to speak. Great. Thank you. Sorry. There's a question here. You mentioned that we will come out and make some things for it. Do you know what they are made the public land as part of the public process? Do you know what they are? I haven't got the exact answer. I believe that they'll publish in June. And then I think we've got to September to. And they finalise by the end of the year, off the top of the head. But I'll, I'll perhaps get a feel for the whole time. I don't know if I'm doing this. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Point number 11 Minutes of Board of Committees, uh, members of the Committee, the Resolve Minutes, Appendies. F1 pages number 165 and 69, appendix G1 to G2, pages 171 and 176, and appendix H2, H1 to H2, pages 177 to 189. So, the are noted. Moving on to point number 12, questions. There will be a slight change to questions due to the nature of the council meeting being streamed live, normally questions would not be spoken out loud, but I would allow the questions to be spoken out loud for transparency for the internet viewers. Um, Councillor Veronica Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Would the council join with me in congratulating Arthur Adams University and the Vice Chancellor, Mr. David Trevelyan, in particular? Achieving university status. The first university in Potter, which is within the borough of Tottenham, 
And another six, many attributes and attributes is a fair trade in those people. Thank you. Uh, Actually, when I heard about uh, this uh, back uh, uh, around about the uh, beginning of December, I wrote a letter of uh, congratulating the principal, you know, and I had a copy of it. I'm delighted to hear the hard records that been recommended and so on uh, for uh, the title of the university. And then uh, uh, I think it was on the 11th of December, which was about eight, nine days, I had a letter back from the vice chancellor and said, uh, Delighted to be able to let you know that we have uh, received confirmation for the Privy Council that we may uh, change our title to university. So, uh, yes, uh, it is important. It is the only university in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Shropshire, even though I have to declare interest, uh, and because I am on the, university, uh, on, on the governing board of the OAC University, and they do have a campus in your, uh, uh, in your ward, and, they, and uh, you know, they, they do well. But then you're quite right. This is First, for the Welsh University, and I'm very pleased about that. And can I also uh, mention that you mentioned the, the Fair Trade University at the end of it, and we were both there a couple of weeks ago for the launch of the Fair Trade uh, Agreement, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, you know I went there with you, and you're our Fair Trade champion, and I'm very pleased about that. And uh, I understand that we uh, are a meeting uh, tomorrow or next week, is it? Uh, Tomorrow is it, yes. And then what this is, Mr. Mayor, is through you, uh, is that we, what we put the council in to do is to take a step further uh, how we can operate and do more for the fair trade and get a right price for uh, people who produce these uh, fair trade products. So, congratulations to Rapa Art Bank, uh, congratulations to everyone from the council, and I fully agree with uh, Veronica there. Thank you, Mr. I do have a supplemental, and yeah. that leads me very well into the supplemental. So I'd like to thank you, and it is vital that we all promote our university as well as the wealth of opportunities in the borough. Therefore, I would like to ask that you and the council will join with me in thanking Barbara and Alton's University for promoting all that they do and achieve, and for hosting. And promoting the launch of the Alfred and the Fair Trade Alliance, which took place at the beginning of Fair Trade Fortnight, which we're still in. This is a significant step forward for the Alliance towards fair trade status for the borough, the ultimate goal. Of course, you can. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to question number two it's Councillor Ian Fletcher to Councillor Sean Davis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, would Councillor Sean Davis please advise residents of Priorsley regarding the current status of Priorsley Community Centre from the decision of the Cabinet to remove the Centre from the community portfolio? Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. The Council's cross party um, scrutiny committee completed a review of all council managed community centres in July 2012. The findings of the Shrinking Committee were that Prizing did not function as a community centre, but rather a, as a preschool, and as such, the recommendation was to transfer the building to the council's property portfolio to the view of the facility being leased to the Prizing preschool, as they are the main use of the facility. Um, as, as, as it stands, Councillor Fletcher, the current status is that the management of the community centre is still within the council um, uh, community centre management team. And while we're doing the new pieces, it's a place. Can I supplementary question? Yes, I have, Mr. Mayor. Um, you stated that the lease has not yet been granted. Could you give an assurance to the residents of Prior's League that safeguards will be in place so that those residents can still have access to the community centre when not used by the preschool? Thank you very much for that sort of mention, Captain Fletcher. What I can do is assure you that the work with the police will be ongoing as all well members you will consult it. With regards to the use when the police will are aren't um, used in the building itself, we also suggest the details of the data for the Thank you. Um, moving on to question number three, this is again Councillor Ian Fletcher, directed uh, Councillor Elder Rose. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, question to the cabinet member of the Transport and Community Protection. Uh, following her response to my question at the last council meeting, will the council use her uh, good officers to institute measures to ensure that the safety of persons near to and accessing from the uh, Wings development on the old Hollyhead Road? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, at the council meeting on the 24th of January, I did explain that no accidents involving personnel had been reported on the Elliot Road in connection with Wicks and Aldi's access, which has been in place since 2011. The current junction arrangement of the Ghost Island right turn lanes is the same as it was when the site was the brickworks. The transport assessment submitted for the Brooks and Alley planning application confirmed that the current arrangement would cater for the traffic flows in and out of that source. And I can remember you as chairman of the plans board dealing with that application. And an alternative junction arrangement either a mini roundabout or all tra traffic signals, possibly including the Furnish Road Junction, would have to be prioritised and funded from the Council's Highway and Transport Capital Budget. Land purchase would be required, so the cost would be significant. Alternatively, contributions on further developments at Central Park could be used to fund these changes, although there are no proposals from developers at this moment in time. A pedestrian refuge and foot, uh, footway improvement has been introduced in the vicinity of the Central Park access to facilitate improved access for pedestrians to the Silky Way and the bus stops. So, on this question, uh, Councillor Fletcher, I can only assure you that <coughs> continued monitoring of the traffic situation in this location will take place with officers. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, is that supplementary? <coughs> yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, pedestrians are taking their uh, lives in their hands while they're trying to cross this road <coughs> because of the increase in traffic. Would I assume from uh, the uh, comments from the cabinet member that they're not going to do anything until the debate flight? No, I wouldn't say that. Now, to be fair to the officers, and I said I can assure you that they will be monitoring the situation. Because it was mentioned in the planning application, like um, there was money set aside for traffic. Um, monitoring and that was going to, go to continue from the 2009 I think the meeting was until about 2011 or five years it was up I think the thing was I can't remember exactly but I know that you chaired that meeting so monitoring will take place in this situation. Council Fletcher, the assumption that councils won't react to messes of death is not a very wise thing to say. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor, Mr. Mayor, I'm only using my experience from where I had with my children going to school in uh, another area where we were for a um, safety crossing to get to the school and the transport officers told us what they will happen. Uh, it's and nothing to do with it. Uh, crossing to school is a completely different matter, Councillor. Moving on. Um, Point number four, uh, question number four, sorry. Councillor Ian Fletcher again to Councillor Paul Watley. Councillor Paul Watley's absence, Councillor Richard Overton will respond. Thank you. Would the Councillor explain why there was no consultation with the residents of Priestley regarding the access to the proposed school site in Priestley by the Teach Drive before <coughs> he and his cabinet colleagues went ahead with the decision? Purchase 
and the defence budget. Um, well, council budget is well aware that a number of different options have been considered for the last five years. Five years in order to build a new sector still implies me. The decision to revisit the land option at the old solicitor site was taken as a result of the previous owners of the land going into liquidation. This move has been warmly welcomed by a large number of Council of Fletcher's residents, who are members of the Rising Residents Action Group, if they know them very well. Um, full consultation will take place to access the proposed site during the relevant planning process, which is expected to be in July of this year. Residents of Tees Close and any other interested parties will be invited to share their views about the close of this time, which is in line with established council policy on new developments. To my thought, council will like welcome the fact that this site will be adjourned. Council, may you get the question, Yes, um, there was considerable consultation about the site, and uh, the recommendations from uh, residents and myself was that any access to the new school site should be from Castle Park Way. This has been completely, as it means, the most appropriate route to prevent the traffic going through the housing developments. This is not the take place. Can I ask why you didn't purchase the land for access from Castle Park Way to this site? Thank you. All I'd say to Council Fletcher is that, you know, during the planning process there will be full consultation with residents. Um, the site um, was in the under negotiation for quite a long time. We've had questions of capital before from uh, the position of the site. Um, and I thought that Council Fletcher, as I said before, would welcome this because uh, part of the residents action group were opposed to the development on the other side due to issues of traffic and noise and uh, access. Um, and as I said, um, you know, I can get a full reply for you, Councillor Fletcher, if you want, on why that wasn't considered. Um, but uh, you know, what I'm saying is, I think this site is more suitable than the other site, and the prize event is actually welcome it. Thank you, Joe. That is the end of the questions. Um, moving on to uh, item 13. I'll note the motion. Uh, may I refer members to the revised copy of the motion that have been placed on your tables? You can print copy the original agenda paper. Okay, I'll move to um, catch the light items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In line with the questions, do you want to read the motion out? Yes, please. Uh, this council urges the government to take immediate action to counteract the proliferation of legal loan charges by ensuring that a bill introducing a cap on the amount of interest that can be charged on short-term and payday loans is scheduled for debate during this Parliament. The Council also urges the Government to further strengthen consumer protections by ensuring a breach of these rules would make any loan agreement unenforceable by the lender. Um, can I start by saying um, I don't believe access um, to uh, credit is a bad thing. Um, it can help us own our own home, go to university, serve our own business. The truth is, all too often, those who need credit the most, people who often need to borrow just to put food on the table, are charged the highest price for it. Indeed, UK borrowers pay the highest price for credit in the whole of Europe. People on low incomes in Telford and across the country are today being targeted by high cost lenders who are legally allowed to charge whatever they like for a loan. This is legal loan charge. It is a national scandal and it must be stopped. Let me give you some examples that I've come across here in our borough. Last month, a door-to-door -door lender operating certainly in the borough, but definitely in my ward, the college ward, was charging up to £82 for every £100 borrowed when you included all the arrangements and admin charges. 
you will have heard of Wonga.com. Wonga recently launched an iPhone application which allows a borrower to have short-term loans directly transferred into their account within the space of a few minutes. This comes with a whopping APR of 2,700%. <coughs> Past few months, I've been collecting various local stories from desperate people who have suffered at the hands of legal loan sharks. <coughs> One story from a retired lady who lives in College Ward sticks in my mind in particular. She retired a few years ago, and last autumn, she desperately needed to get her hands on some cash to buy a new fire for her living room. A new fire, not a new car, not an expensive holiday. A fire so she could heat her home and keep warm. She borrowed £500 in good faith from the jolly man that came knocking on her door. She genuinely did not realise the trouble she was about to get into. She has ended up paying back over £2,000 that way. That lady could easily be the mum, your aunt, your dad, or your neighbour. All over our country, particularly in this borough, there are people just like her who are having to choose between heating their homes or servicing unaffordable debts. So that is why I'm proposing this motion and urging the government to take action by capping the cost of all forms of uh, consumer credit. Caps, I should tell you, that already exist in France, already exist in Germany, Australia, and the vast majority of US states. It works in these countries. It can work in this country as well. <coughs> Grateful to you for listening. I appeal to all members to get behind this motion and fully support it. Thank you. Thank you, SRI. Uh, do we have a second? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm going to second this motion now to speak because usually when I second a motion, and I like to speak, I don't need to speak. Um, start with life, I'm, going to um, I'm seconding this motion tonight because I think there needs to now to be a change in how companies such as Wonder, Amigo, and payday loans are monitoring the next state. The reason these companies are now exploiting our residents is because the USA decided to try and protect theirs. So now they have come to the UK to impose their legal loaning extortion interest rates on those people. I say that this because it is fact, as Councillor Ryan says, the UK's poorest borrowers pay the highest price for credit in the world. Around 3 million people use this very high cost door to door or home credit lending market. Which is worth £2 million to those companies. A million and a half more indebted to pay to payday lenders, which have short term loans with APR that often begins at 600% and can escalate to some of 4,000%. These rates are out of control. The desperation sees residents turning ever so more to these companies for help. This isn't help with flashed adverts and easy quick payments that get you trapped in the extortion amount of interest rates. One girl turns into Dick Turner. So let's try and protect those who are most vulnerable in our town. The global recession has taken its toll. The changes to welfare and tax credits will again cause more people to be financially worse off. And look to these legal loan charts for easy way out. But they are simply not the answer. They need to be regulated. And also, go a little bit further, companies such as Brightex too need to be included. Often goods for large amounts of APR is not good. But people see the weekly monthly payment as an easy way to get the goods they need. So I ask Council to do two things tonight. One, support this motion to try and send a message to the government to legislate and cap these uh, payday companies. And two, promote our local fair share credit union as a safe and fair alternative to the workers of this world. Thank you, Council. Over to Council Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, um, starting off on um, a light note, what is this 
the Troy a um, license area issue. Um, I must record that um, I'm no longer listening to uh, just a minute on Radio 4 since uh, Nicholas Barton started doing the commercials for Bongo. We have three quite personal change that I've been listening to that show since my grandfather first did use it, to me back in 1978. Um, but um, on to the music issue. Um, although I was very, very pleased early on this week uh, to read the recommendations made by the um, Oxford Trading regarding these. Um, Daily alone firms um, identify practices that include a failure to work out whether people could afford the loans, aggressive debt collection practices, a failure to explain how repayments are collected, and a lack of sufficient forbearance for those who cannot afford the repayments. And given these companies, um, I believe, 12 weeks um, to mend their practices, um, it absolutely stunned me at the time that among the recommendations was not the simple one that causes the most damage and harm, a simple recommendation that they cap the interest rates. Um, I'm fully in support of uh, Council Island's motion and I intend to vote for it. Thank you very much. Um, catch the next Standards 
department are working very hard on this to protect the public. They're working with the partnership with the national legal money lending team, Beacon Housing Trust, CAB, and the Fair Share Credit Union. So we are really working really hard to protect these people. <laughs> and I'm certainly done it's an excellent motion and I will support it. Thank you. I really support this motion because I to my experience when I was to work in the county court many years ago, I saw a tragedy where people couldn't pay their debts and they had to go to um, have loans which they could never afford and they didn't have to court. It's really very hard to and to say, to see that this, this uh, industry is gaining £2 million, pounds, I think is absolutely atrocious. Um, I also support um, Credit Union, but there's a problem in some respects that if people haven't any money to invest, but if they have not money to save, first of all, they cannot take any money out. So, is there a way that we can help people through Credit Union without having to, first of all, have money invested in that. The other thing is, if so many students have been caught up in this, could we not as well promote this in our, in our universities, in our colleges, and even all um, to our community centres and all the things that we have in place at the moment to help people? Because they do not understand that there's no credit check, no ways of uh, being able to pay it back, and that they are at once uh, have to the day on which is going to be paid back, they have to put extra fees on top of that as well. And it mounts and mounts and mounts until it gets to 4,000%. And I think it is really disgraceful. So I support this motion. And I also um, would like to say that the government is looking because it was announced actually in Parliament on Wednesday. That they are looking at having apparently they've already consulted with some people uh, who have uh, uh, a knowledge on uh, this sort of debt and they are looking into it. The Office of Fair Trade are doing it, the government is also there, so we hope that this will happen. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, Councillor Thomas. Yes, I'll ask for everything that's been said before, but I'm conscious that um, in the last paragraph in that sentence, council urges the government to further strengthen consumer protection. I think that's extremely important. Very often they allow industries to self govern, and I think they've allowed this industry to self govern with the fact that they have to self govern in the interests of the individuals. It's got to be rules that are laid down by government for these industries. And make sure there's no loopholes that companies are doing by the internet or through other things can get around. So it's got to cover all aspects of it. There are other people that have indicated to speak. I'll allow the people to speak if there's anyone that's against the motion. Or, or I believe that, that the topic has actually been covered sufficiently. No, yes, it's been, sec been proposed, it's been seconded. Both the motion? All in favor, unanimous. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Councillor Ryan for that motion. Um, Councillor Derek White, on the recording to the council. Uh, proceed your royal the following motion. The motion is to ask the council to put the along with written motion on this opportunity. Um, the motion is perhaps to ask the council to ask our leader to write to the government to repeal the bedroom tax legislation. The, bed the bedroom tax legislation actually affects 760,000 uh, families in England. Now, 660,000 families works out of 2 million people. It affects 2,600 families in Telford. So, quite frankly, the people are given two choices. Either if you've got one bedroom too much, you end up being 40%. Two bedrooms too much, 25%. Now, I'm probably I'm not sure, but it's probably the only drinking house in the uh, It's in the Cambridge, it's here. Um, so, probably I'm more affected 
than anyone else. Because Hava and Kali goes to Kunti, and Hava is the only frog we need for the respect. Now, this attracts people to the person. This attracts people to the person. So there's a job in the house. <coughs> this affects uh, two thirds of the families are probably uh, disabled. This affects single uh, mothers who are um, working, who try to keep, go, yeah, keep a job. But because of it, they have to give up two children of under the age of uh, 16 for the same sex. Okay, they're losing 40% of their income. The question I was asking was, right, what happens then? So they give you two choices, either move or pay the money. When it came to the, when we, when I had a look at the rents, it didn't make economic sense for the government to do this. So I asked the housing trust, what is your average payments to your rents? For a one bedroom property, it's 68 pounds, for a two bedroom, it's 73 pounds. <coughs> what do I then ask when it comes to tax? How much will you actually give in benefit? For a two bedroom property, in a private rent, they're allowed 109 pounds. Now, if you look at it, 73 pounds of property, which is the average rent of a housing trust property, going from the three bedroom down to that, or going to take from a three bedroom property to a private rent, you would end up costing in benefits <coughs> in the order of an extra 30,000 pounds in benefits, which is absolutely nonsensical. How could you be estimating that you're going to be saving money when you're actually making people move to properties that are going to cost the country more? It makes absolutely no sense so whatsoever. You add into that cost in the misery and taking people who are disabled away from the support network, from their friends, their families, where they the area that we there for many, many years. And remembering most of these people have been there 10, 15, probably 20 years in their home. You cannot expect people to like this stuff because of vulnerable area that I think about. This is equal to poor tax. And it is actually, if anyone looks in the net, you can see what most of the people think about this. It is not an acceptable <coughs> thing at all. The people who are going to be affected are going to have to pay for the removal of the furniture. They're going to have to sell a lot of the furniture that they built up because it, it's going to go to small houses. They're going to have to get rid of a lot of the memories, especially the people who are 59, 60, who have built up that house. They're going to get rid of all that memories of the family, the housing, and the died, all the misery. They're untold the misery that they're going to have to go through this. This is a deeply unpopular tax. And I'm asking everybody in this chamber to actually support this. You owe it to the people you represent. You owe it to the country because it's going to cost the country more. So please support it. Thank you. Second motion. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Arling. I'd like to repeat what <laughs> I'd like to repeat what Councillor White has said. The bedroom tax <coughs> is the present day equivalent of Thatcher's small tax. I do hope that Cameron <laughs> suffers the same fate as Thatcher after her vote. <coughs> this is a government that knows it is a one term government. It is seeking to roll back the welfare state and public services to such an extent that it will take years to recover. This government is pushing them forward deeper into poverty, the longer term result of ill health, increasing crime, and poor people subject to poor living standards, poor housing, and as we've heard, legal and even illegal land sharing. This is ultimately a recipe for civil unrest. Now as a democratic socialist, I hold dear the principles of equality and fairness. 
So I support this motion, <coughs> and I will redouble my efforts to remove this pernicious government at the next election. Sorry, Councillor Paul, I apologise for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as you're aware, um, I can try and take away a latest amendment uh, to the motion that I have to you quite well, just to be aware of another one. Um, in many ways, I support the rest behind this motion, um, as it applies to uh, those residents living in the Telford um, region. However, the motion within this current wording is one that I can't support uh, for two key reasons. One being that uh, the Act has now passed through both chambers of Parliament um, without an amendment being sought, and therefore has now passed into law, so that amendment is possible. And secondarily, the basic, the basic fact that a reduction in a benefit payment is not a tax. A reduction in tax is a tax. And really, as long as we get the wording right, then there is an awful lot within this that I support. I am fully aware that the Welfare Reform Act 2012 is now law, but it does remove a portion of housing benefit from up to 2613 for the vulnerable residents in social housing within our borough. I also agree that these reductions in in housing benefits will place additional financial burdens on social housing towns within the borough, and the shortage of suitable housing in Telford and Reiki prevents many residents affected by the changes from finding suitable alternative, alternative housing on a local basis. Although I welcome that pensioners have been excluded from the change to housing benefit, and the grant have been made available by central government to really get the impact on the residents with a disability, and that grants can be applied to other groups, and that we all have a part to play in ensuring the effects of these changes are not felt most by those who have the lowest capacity to respond. I would fully agree with the idea of asking the leader to write to the Secretary of State for communities asking for a commitment that the reduction in housing benefit is shaped to take into account the needs of residents in social housing with, the, with disabilities, those who have shared custody of children, serving military parents, and foster carers. And I would also be a very strong advocate of the council committee to make every effort to make sure that every scrap of grant funding is available um, to lessen the impact on those residents here now and into the future. I, I really do support the main thrust behind this motion, but the very counterproductive political aspects within which it can be presented is the sole reason why I cannot vote for it tonight. I, I support the principle, but I do not support the political mo mo the political motivation. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Thorrell, playing around with words so he can't support this motion. It's whether you agree with the benefit tax or not, that's what it's about. Um, and I've been in the Labour Party for over 30 years now. I joined um, in the early 30 years when the attack on working people was pretty savage and where there was a glossy of me, myself, I. And of course, the ready poll tax, which saw the unions uh, take to the streets in protest. However, Mr. Mayor, never ever in my political life have I witnessed anything so abhorrent as this government's federal tax. It's unworkable, shambolic, and to add to the chaos the Department of Work and Pensions has, has committed, there aren't even enough smaller properties for families to move to. This bedroom tax, Mr. Mayor, persecutes families with disabled kids and adults. It hammers divorce dads when they need fathers to see their children. And soldiers fighting in Afghanistan are betrayed by this government yet again. But what is the Tory argument? Well, apparently we are scaremongery. Uh, so the thousands of heartbreaking stories we're hearing on a daily basis should not be heard because apparently they are scaremongery too. That's their line at the moment. <coughs> but the reality is, in April, uh, 13,000 millionaires will get a tax cut 
with 100 times a year on average, while over 600 times households across the UK, including in armed force families, disabled people, and foster carers will have to find up to £728 a year to pay in a new bedroom tax. This will affect 2,613 households in Telford and Meekin. So I urge everyone, every one of you in this chamber tonight, to do the right thing, to vote against um, the bedroom tax, support this motion, and vote. Vote with your conscience. Thank you. It isn't only the money. There are far reaching effects for this. You take a single parent that's in the three bedrooms with children, you're oversubscribed. You need a two bedroom. Alright, I'll apply for a two bedroom. But suddenly, what about the child? that started school or started secondary school and has been there 12 months and is really settled. Oh, well, that's too bad. We'll find you a two bedroom on the other side uh, of the borough. That upheaval to those children, and particularly, you know, kids are cruel. And people have heard me say this before, but they will it'll be there. I had a move to the other side because my mom. Uh, has got this bedroom tax against it. That is unfair. Secondly, you know, Derek's already said about, and uh, <coughs> we've got a family to go and see in London. Very distressed about having to get rid of the family furniture that they've been had for years. Secondly, quite interesting, another lady in Donington, told her you need a one bedroom. But she saw a suitable grandfather that would have been brilliant for their disabilities that would have been great for her, so she put in for it. The family wrote a guarantee, a guarantee of the excess rent. Did she get that property, although she was top of the list? No. The rules are one bedroom to one of you. So from the 1st of April, not only is she going to pay this extra 14%, because she will not have moved, it'll be 25 <laughs> Absolutely appalling. Absolutely appalling. It really is, again, the poll tax. And the other thing is, you start and wait till people suddenly realise that they can't find the extra 25%. There'll be a lot of people not paying their rent. <coughs> I bet people only have to say, excuse the expression, you can all get stuffed, it doesn't matter what you're doing, I'm not paying this extra rent. I'll give it six months when they're in arrears and somebody wants to send the bailiffs in. And would you all like to stand up if you were in their position? If you would be happy to take in a lodger that you didn't know that he's on housing benefits to share your home? And the answer would be no. Thank you, Councillor Fair. Um, Councillor Dunmore, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I mean, what we, what we do need to remember, and uh, Councillor Ringy, the Democratic Socialist, saying, Quality and fairness, and we have to make sure that it is fairness for all. It doesn't matter if you're a poor family in a social landlord or a private landlord, you should be treated exactly the same. And there are a, a couple of points, you know, and I fully accept it's ridiculous if you've got a disabled person whose home is specially adapted, and then they have to move to another home, and you've still got to pay the cost to adapt to the new home. So that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. The, the one thing that is, uh, uh, is the shortage of affordable housing. Now, this is on the plans board. There's been many, many uh, amendments to applications, which has actually reduced the amount of affordable 
and sleep with. And also, we had a ridiculous situation whereby we had a development a few, few weeks ago which wasn't viable because if, if, if there was any affordable housing in there at all. And that was 200 houses. And yet, the last plans board, we had a development that had about 10 houses and had four affordable houses. And that was viable. So if we're going to make sure that there are the homes for these people to move into, or when we're going to have to start working at the plant board. So the the But the thing is that we do we do need to make sure that when we are passing a residential development that there is sufficient affordable housing in there. And I've argued time and time again that it's not happening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I wasn't intended to, to, to come into this debate, and, but but Borrell's remark just puzzled me. You know, I, I mean, you can't amend an act after it's been through Parliament. I suppose we still have cop fighting in this country. I mean, window tax. Uh, so, so of course, I mean, the, the, the detail of this legislation will be regulations, and it's perfectly possible to seek amendments to those regulations and make them before. Uh, and and uh, Dean Duncan Smith could, 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 can and should do that when, when he realises that, 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 that it's still for that legislation. The second point of, uh, about um, you know, the bedroom tax is it's uh, a tax and not a lot. I watched the Prime Minister's question time yesterday as well. Uh, I saw Cameron five times try to say it's not called the bedroom tax, it's called something else. Uh, uh, well, I'm afraid you didn't learn the lessons of history. You kept on saying it's not the whole tax, it's a community charge, and that's not what, the, 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 what everybody knows it as. Everybody knows it's a, a bedroom tax, and let's not be afraid to say it. Thank you very much, Councillor. So I have um, five more speakers that have indicated. Uh, I will remind uh, Councillor not to repeat in his comments. Thank you very much. Councillor Ryan Fletcher. <coughs> Thanks, Mayor. So people have been talking tonight about being unfair, but this council has been unfair to the people of the borough. They've turned out a million pounds to help phone services, and people help for the council tax support grant. Working people, the administration has compounded their actions. And increased council tax by 2.9 last year and further 1.9 tonight. They're claiming they are not enough for the people. And everyone is satisfied with their decision. Well, they're not. The Welcome Reform Act has re regulations in place for more funds available to help all who are in need to make up the shortfall in housing benefits after assessment. And the exemptions to restrictions of housing benefits and discretionary housing payment, payments for those who need it. In 2008, the Labour government put in place this very assessment for the numbers of rooms and occupied in the private sector. In other words, a private sector size criteria. I've never heard a word against those measures from the members opposite. I wonder why. Now this is extended to social tenants, in the social rented sector, who are the benefits to whom the social rented rules restriction apply, because that's what it's called. You call it a bedroom tax. This regarded the full context of the regulations and causing distress and confusion to people. There are safeguarding and discretionary grants in place, as well as exemptions, whereby the 14% restriction benefit is not applicable. Pensioners, parents with severely disabled children, people who need around the clock care, people who need medical room in their properties, and homes that have been adapted for the disability needs, but amongst others. In the past, this council deducted benefits from persons in receipt of benefit, with a member of their family or visitors came to stay in their home. 
I ask the public answer to the question, does this council still get benefit in such circumstances? No one has the not real care and compassion. We have to live within the means we have and through the means and grants available to the council and not reject grant help that has been offered by government as it has been done in the last two years. I would have supported the amendment because it is absolutely vital that we do cover other categories, but Mayor seems fit to rule this out. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Councillor Hudson, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is where you see the great political divide, and we really care. Um, David Cameron's bedroom tax tells you all you need to know about him and his comfort. The Tories like to try and say they're targeting the skybers, but the reality is very different. This unfair policy will hit working people and the most vulnerable. Two thirds of the households hit are homes to someone with a disability. Families of soldiers serving our country will have to find extra money for their sons and daughters' bedroom, and foster families helping children in need of a home will also hit. We had Councillor Molly talk about working together for the Outlook After Children budget. This will have a severe impact on this. At exactly the same time as the bedroom tax comes into effect, David Cameron is giving thousands of millionaires a tax cut of under thousand pounds a year. David Cameron and Ian Duncan Smith have been forced to admit that it's impossible for their plans to solve under occupancy because there aren't enough smaller homes for families to move to, but they still implement this policy. In town, for 47% of working age tenants in the social rented sector will be affected by the benefit reduction in town and weekend because they have more bedrooms than they need to need. From the Guardian to the Sun, everybody is warning David Cameron that his policy is a mess, but ministers are refusing to listen. Families being forced out of their long-term family home for political spite, because that's what it is. Not only is the Tories plans unfair, but they're now in such a mess that they could end up costing more than they save in many parts of the country. As Councillor White said, families are made homeless or pushed into expensive private rental accommodation, the taxpayer could actually be left with a higher bill and still the problem of under occupancy will not be solved. The government talk about game about the discretionary housing payment. The telephone week in there increased the budget by £200,000. £200,000 won't go very far. There will be many families that this pot can help in this time of economic crisis. And when you, when you think you're paying families who've got children, they were under 10 years old, being forced out of their homes by the bedroom tax. In a year's time, they will need to be moved again because they're allowed to have another move under the bedroom tax. As I said in my first slide, this reform shows a government in their true colours. We see no legislation on bankers' bonuses, no legislation on a bachelor tax, but legislation that attacks the most vulnerable and poor. Families with service personnel, carers, working families, foster carers and the disabled. Those people who can ill afford to take this in. This is the new poll tax. We need to send a message to David Cameron and Duncan Smith and tell them that these forms will not work. They take no account of local housing supply or future needs. <coughs> Let's make sure this government gets their priorities right. Stop the bedroom tax and support this motion. Many things have been said, and most of them on this side of the house, I have to say, I, I do agree with this. The government's uh, reform to the current benefit system is flawed on many levels. Uh, foster carers will effectively have to start paying for <coughs> some of the UK's most vulnerable children. This foster care will not be counted within this scheme, and yet a foster family will now be deemed as under occupying a house, and their housing benefit will be deducted. But by law, Foster children have to have their own bedroom. This has not been taken into account. The government is preparing to implement a tax that will hit the weakest in society. Say that the people who need a bedroom for their carer will face a massive cut to their housing benefit, and there's simply nowhere else for them to move to. It will have a direct impact on the vulnerable people, reducing their standard of living to a level that we should all be ashamed of for our welfare state. Yet the concern seems to be falling on deaf ears within the government. The discussion of homes with disabled people 
the people who need a bed for their carer. They'll have a choice between putting their food bill, putting their care bill, or just living the night without a nighttime carer and hoping nothing happens to them. The other threats to benefits include lone parents and grandparents who use their spare bedroom to share the care of their own children, grandchildren, and couples who sleep separately for medical reasons. To say the children who have their homes specially adapted as them previously said. Crucially, the extra room often isn't a spare room. It is the place the family carer stays when a parent's ill, or the space a teenager needs. We believe that penalising families, just the living the lives that the rest of us take for granted, is unfair and is unjust. So much for we're all in it together. Thank you. Mr Mayor, I believe all parties are concerned that the changes being brought about by this Welfare Reform Act, welcome as they are in many cases, will nevertheless, for some working age tenants, have a particularly significant effect. There is general concern that those with disabilities, foster carers and others will be particularly hard hit by the removal of the spare room subsidy. However, the government has already recognised this situation and is making grants available to enable councils to consider these cases and give help where appropriate. Maybe this is not enough, but if you have been willing to accept our amendment to your motion, then we would have been happy to support the letter to the Secretary of State seeking additional support. However, it has to be said that the concerns you are now showing for these effective groups are nothing more than crocodile tears. Where were, your voices, where were your raised voices when in 2008 a Labour government removed the spare room subsidy for those on benefit living in private rental accommodation? I heard nothing. Where would your thinking when for the last two years you have refused government support for its counter tax when you already knew these welfare benefit changes were coming in? And especially what were you thinking of when you refused in £600,000 support from the government is a limited council tax change to 8% for those of working age on benefits. Instead, they are all now facing a council tax charge of 21%. Talk about double whammies. Yes, these changes were coming in, but you managed to make the charges higher than necessary on top of a higher than necessary tax base. I know you will say that the government, that the money from the government is not enough. So don't waste your breath. Just know that the vast majority of other counties have managed to recognise the additional difficulties from res some residents would find themselves in. Uh, if they did not, if they did what you have done. So uh, to reach some fairness now is the absolute height of hypocrisy. These are not easy times. We all recognise that, including the government. Including the government DWP has increased our discretionary housing payments for next year by three and a half times, from 102,000 to 367,000, to help the very people we are all talking about. To quote from a slide on the uh, DHP, uh, to quote from a slide on DHP chairman of the recent training sessions, this is recognition of the fact that certain customers genuinely need an additional bedroom that can be allowed uh, under the very rigid bedroom tax rules and do not have the option of moving to a smaller unit of accommodation that is suitable for the requirements. These payments will be made to the very people we are all concerned about if they do not have the means to pay for the short form of rent for their other income. Thank you, Simon. Councillor Mike. Thank you. Isn't it wonderful that people would have a home I couldn't care less that there were people whose homes are going to be threatened the area? And this comes from a group that every one of their councils to a man objected to the plans board and this side's uh, uh, plans for extra housing in this budget, they even hijacked the site with them. They don't want people living in their town by then. And Councillor Dugmore 
and you social energy in others. There is a develop a cause for social energy. That development doesn't go forward anyway. So I don't really see the point of your argument, if you know that very well. So you can't move away from that from the bedroom tax in that way. It's a disgraceful tax, it's threatening families, you couldn't care less, you've objected to most schemes for housing bill, and you know where the town is, we all know where the town is, I'm sure that the, uh, the newspaper tell us on a regular basis. So quite frankly, when Council Seymour talks about crocodile tears, I wonder if there's a, a, what the, the level of social housing is in the world. Whether the bedroom tax will take effect in the world, like it does with all the others, whether it's deprivation, whether it's poverty. You couldn't care less, could you? You just couldn't care less. <laughs> Can I ask all councillors to come to Wellington to the KIP project in Wellington and speak to people who are homeless, who are desperate for accommodation <coughs> and support? Also, the people with special uh, disabilities and learning disabilities, where the key project are in support. Also, we're very pleased at the moment that uh, the CAB have moved to Wellington, but they're very concerned about the extra workload in the next weeks with a bedroom tax. This is very, very concerning and frightening to people in our areas, perhaps not in the rural areas. But in our areas here. <coughs> uh, at the moment, we're getting nothing but cuts, cuts, and cuts to people's lives, people's services, the fire, the police. And not only that, how many shops on the high street are closing? Comics, uh, HMB, Peacocks, Thomas Cook, all these shops are disappearing, making more and more people redundant trying to find jobs. <coughs> Hey, Councillor Thompson. Um, Councillor Fletcher. Yeah. I shan't uh, take my opportunity on most of the points I was going to make by colleague Councillor Seymour and Colleague May. I support what they want to say. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Um, Councillor Green. very deep thought and independent thought, which distresses me to see the members across the different sides of the chamber accusing each other of not caring. I think what I observe is that everyone cares in a different way, perhaps we don't quite know how to resolve it. Um, as far as I'm aware, there won't be any elections for another two years, but how to work with the system that we've got, we don't like it, <coughs> we have to try and make it bespoke locally. We have to see what we can do locally to help the people that bring us as elected members. So I would like to suggest that we have a cross party committee. I know some people say we're not really integer, but that we have a committee. And instead of just slapping each other off across the chamber, we get very well informed councillors to speak on behalf of different types of claims. The calls that I've had are often from single people who are not, you know, the emotive case of perhaps a gentleman who lives on his own, who's been divorced or whose partner has passed away. There are different categories of claimants. You know, you get a couple of these very well able to speak councillors to designate a group to them and work out what we can do best for those individual categories of people. I'm sure that together we can perhaps achieve something here locally. And we could also work with those private landlords who we have um, alienated in some cases, work with them to try and see what we can do to house the people that are going to need housing. So come on members, 
how we sort of slag each other off and perhaps I'll share it and stop slagging each other off. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, I suggest you uh, talk to the leaders of the different groups and the secretary for your discussion. Uh, Councillor McClellance, and then I believe Councillor Davis is the same as I just want to correct some misinformation. Councillor Seymour made some claim, it's absolutely not true. I mean, the discretionary funding of government to help the bedroom tax is 250,000 extra compared to the forward. That's one tenth of the cuts. <coughs> so, that in theory, can only help one in ten families. This is if we got enough money to solve the problem. It's just not true. Councillor Seymour, the then reason they are arguing about the council tax support scheme. Here again, yes, the government gives, would have given South Korea about 360,000 for one year, but we would have had to find another 680,000 to subsidise that. And then when, next year, when they hide all this money in the general uh, settlement and we don't see it, we take all this board away. So it's not really a good uh, financial argument. Thank you. Um, <coughs> So, Mr. Mayor, not many issues that make me angry, but this is one of them. I would have, uh, as a child, been subject to the bedroom tax, um, living in Reading House and Trust Property. My nan, who cared for her terminally ill um, husband, would have been subject to the bedroom tax. So, the, the assertion is it's crocodile tears, it's personally offensive, quite frankly. And then, if you want, I think if you want that, want that nas nationally, the same children and the same families will be hit. Um, in total, so by three hundred and thirty million pounds, three hundred and thirty million pounds will come out of the pocket to disabled families and children. You know how much the government are, are, are providing? Thirty million pounds. You can have to get applies and, 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 and a cross party committee all you like. But that will not help real people in real wards like my new man's Lee. Life is about choices. Life is about choices. This coalition government has made a very clear choice to introduce the bedroom tax on the same day, on the same day as introducing a hundred thousand pounds tax cut for millionaires. That is about choices, not principles, not dogma. That is a clear choice. The Council Borough talking about not being able to amend an act of parliament. I really, really despair some of the um, the mistruths and and the uh, lack of education, quite frankly, from the other side. Of the chamber. Of course, you can amend an act of parliament any time. Tonight, we have found out that the opposition don't understand the difference between a deficit and a debt. Yeah. They don't understand the difference between um, 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 statutory legislation and secondary legislation. And they need to go back to school, quite frankly. Eighteen year olds, an eighteen-year-old man lives with his mum and dad in Telford. He is a member of the armed forces. When he is at home, he is able, his family are able to get the maximum help through housing benefit. He goes away, not on holiday, he goes to Afghanistan to fight for the country, to fight for this country. The privilege that his parents have got for forcing their son in arms way is to pay the spare room subsidy. How's that family got a spare room? No. The same children. An eight-year-old girl who's disabled and needs help with a brief and threat night will be forced to share a room with a six-year-old brother, brother. How has that family got a spare room? No. Foster families. Well, I'm praying for your union of discretion to finish my speech, Mr. Mayor. I'm very passionate about the future. A disabled child, excuse me, sorry, made that point, the foster families. When a foster parent takes a foster placement with a, a child with complex, complex needs, will be forced to share a bedroom with a sibling in that house. A disgrace. Not extremes, real life cases. I'll give you 30 seconds. Thank you very much. And then I'll be clear that those councillors, I don't know, I can see from across the, the way, Councillor Badney, Councillor Badney and Councillor Wallace Hospital left the room. Labour, Conservative, Lib Dems, and those of no party nationally are standing up and saying this is unfair, immoral, and unworkable. Work, those people who vote against or even on saying, even on saying against this motion, are turning their back on <coughs> foster parents, on service families, families who have um, had uh, lost children, and families who have children. I mean, I'm only the last to vote for this matter.